Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Mrs. Brown sees you because she wants to discuss HRT in detail, including the pros and cons of the various preparations available. Do you say, of course, ask me anything you want? Or do you go... If you are in the second group, then you know exactly how I feel. So today, we will go through the NICE guideline on the diagnosis and management of the menopause from a primary care perspective. Make sure that you stay for the entire episode because at the end, I will also go through a one-page summary flowchart giving cost-effective examples of various preparations available, which you will also be able to download. So let's jump into it. I'll let's start by saying that possible symptoms of the menopause include a change in the menstrual cycle, vasomotor symptoms, for example, hot flashes and sweats, musculoskeletal symptoms, for example, joint and muscle pain, effects on mood, for example, low mood, urogenital symptoms, for example, vaginal dryness, and sexual difficulties, for example, low sexual desire. When these symptoms are present, most women will ask for a blood test to check if they are menopausal. Is this really necessary? Well, most of the time, no, it isn't, because NICE says that we can make the following diagnosis without checking FSH levels. Perimenopause in women over 45 with basomotor symptoms and irregular periods, and menopause in women over 45 if they're not using contraception and have not had a period for at least 12 months, or based on symptoms alone if the woman does not have a uterus. Of course, diagnosis can be more difficult if they are on hormonal treatment, but still, we should not check FSH if the woman is on combined hormonal contraception or high-dose progestogen. However, we will consider checking FSH levels to diagnose menopause in women aged 40 to 45 with menopausal symptoms, including a change in the menstrual cycle, and in women under 40 in whom the menopause is suspected. Once we have made the diagnosis, we will give information about lifestyle changes and benefits and risks of treatments, giving information about hormonal treatment like HRT, non-hormonal treatment like clonidine, and non-pharmaceutical treatment, for example, CBT. We will also give information about contraception in the perimenopausal and postmenopausal phase. I have put a link to the guidance in the episode description, but a very simplified summary is that combined hormonal contraception should be stopped at the age of 50 and switched to a safer method, and contraception can be stopped at the age of 55 as the risk of pregnancy is extremely low by then. If the menopause is as a result of medical or surgical treatment, we will give information about fertility before that treatment and we will refer to a menopause specialist. In terms of managing menopausal symptoms, just to say that this summary is not intended for women with premature ovarian insufficiency, that is, women aged under 40. But for vasomot symptoms, we will offer HRT after discussing benefits and risks. We will offer a choice of estrogen and progesterone to women with a uterus, or estrogen alone to women without a uterus. We will not routinely offer SSRIs or SNRIs or clonidine as first-line treatment for vasomotor symptoms alone. We will explain that there is some evidence that isoflavones or black hohosh may relieve vasomotor symptoms, but that preparations may vary, their safety is uncertain, and drug interactions have been reported. In terms of psychological symptoms, we will consider HRT to treat menopause-related low mood, and also consider CBT to treat menopause-related low mood or anxiety. Remember that there's no clear evidence for SSRIs or SNRIs for low mood in menopausal women without a diagnosis of depression. We will consider testosterone supplementation for menopausal women with low sexual desire if HRT alone is not effective. The BNF says that it is not licensed for this indication, so seeking specialist advice before initiation may be advisable. For urogenital atrophy, we will offer vaginal estrogen, including for those on systemic HRT. And we will continue treatment for as long as needed to relieve symptoms. We will also consider vaginal estrogen for urogenital atrophy in those women 
for whom systemic HRT is contraindicated after seeking specialist advice. If a general estrogen does not relieve symptoms, we will also seek specialist advice before increasing the dose. However, we will also explain that symptoms often come back when treatment is stopped, that adverse effects from vaginal estrogen are very rare, and that they should report unscheduled vaginal bleeding. Moisturizers and lubricants for vaginal dryness can be used alone or in addition to vaginal estrogen. And finally, we will not offer routine monitoring of endometrial thickness during treatment with vaginal estrogen. In terms of complementary therapies, we will explain that the efficacy, safety, quality and purity of unregulated products may be unknown and we will also advise that there is uncertainty about the appropriate use of St. John's wort. Once treatment has been started, we will review patients at three months to assess the efficacy and tolerability and annually thereafter unless more often is clinically indicated. We will refer women for specialist advice if treatments are ineffective or cause side effects. There are contraindications to HRT or there is uncertainty about the most suitable treatment option. In terms of starting and stopping HRT, we will explain that unscheduled vaginal bleeding is a common side effect of HRT within the first three months of treatment, but it should be reported at a three-month review or promptly if it happens after the first three months. When stopping HRT, we will consider the choice of gradually reducing or immediately stopping treatment, explaining that gradually reducing HRT may limit recurrence of symptoms in the short term, but that either approach makes no difference to their symptoms in the longer term. There are separate guidelines on the treatment of menopausal symptoms for women with or at high risk of breast cancer, but in general, we will refer to a menopause specialist and ensure that paroxetine and fluoxetine are not given if the patient is on tamoxifen. In terms of long-term benefits and risks of HRT, there is an MHRA summary of HRT risks and benefits that we can refer to to explain the absolute rates per 1,000 women with 5 years or 10 years use of HRT. It is a useful one-page resource and I have included a link to this table in the episode description. But in summary, let's go through the different possible risks and benefits. In terms of venous thromboembolism, we will explain that the risk of thromboembolism is increased by oral HRT, that the risk is greater for oral and transdermal preparations, and that the risk of transdermal HRT is no greater than baseline. Therefore, we will consider transdermal rather than oral HRT if the woman is at increased risk of thromboembolic disease, including those with a BMI over 30. But we will consider hematology referral if the patient is at high risk, for example, if there's a strong family history of thromboembolism or thrombophilia. For cardiovascular disease, we will explain that HRT does not increase cardiovascular disease risk if aged under 60, and that it does not affect cardiovascular mortality. And we must remember that cardiovascular risk factors are not a contraindication to HRT as long as they are optimally managed. So we will explain that the baseline's cardiovascular disease risk varies depending on the risk factors, that HRT with estrogen alone is associated with no or reduced risk of coronary heart disease, and that HRT with estrogen and progestogen is associated with little or no increase in the risk of coronary heart disease. But we will also explain that oral estrogen is associated with a small increase in the risk of stroke, but that the baseline risk under 60 is very low. We will indicate that HRT does not increase the risk of developing type 2 diabetes and does not have an adverse effect on glucose control. But we will consider comorbidities and specialist advice before giving HRT to women with type 2 diabetes. In terms of breast cancer risk, we will make it clear that the baseline risk varies according to risk factors, that HRT with estrogen alone is associated with little or no change in the risk, that HRT with estrogen and progestogen can be associated with an increase in the risk of breast cancer, but that any increase in the risk is related to treatment duration and it goes down after stopping HRT. When discussing osteoporosis, 
we will give women advice on bone health and inform them that the risk of fragility fracture around menopausal age is low and varies from one woman to another. We will say that their risk of fragility fracture is reduced while taking HRT and that this benefit remains during treatment but decreases once HRT stops and that it may continue for longer for those who take HRT also for longer. We will tell patients that the effect of HRT on the risk of dementia is unknown and that HRT may improve muscle mass and strength and that being active helps maintain muscle mass and strength. We will now touch on the diagnosis and management of premature ovarian insufficiency and we will diagnose premature ovarian insufficiency under 40 years of age based on menopausal symptoms, including no or infrequent periods, and an elevated FSH level on two samples taken four to six weeks apart. We will not diagnose premature ovarian insufficiency on a single blood test, and we will not routinely check antimalarian hormone to diagnose it. If there is doubt about the diagnosis, we will seek specialist advice. For their management, we will consider referral, but we may also offer a choice of HRT or a combined hormonal contraceptive and less contraindicated. We will explain the importance of hormonal treatment either with HRT or a combined hormonal contraceptive until at least the age of natural menopause. And the baseline population risk of diseases such as breast cancer and cardiovascular disease increases with age and is very low in women aged under 40. That HRT may have a beneficial effect on blood pressure when compared with combined oral contraceptives. That both HRT and combined oral contraceptives offer bone protection and that HRT is not a contraceptive. Now, as promised, let's have a look at the one-page summary flowchart, giving you some cost-effective examples of preparations that we can use. Obviously, this will change from time to time, so keep an eye on your local formulary too. You can download this flowchart by clicking on the link in the episode description. And we will start with the transdermal options, remembering that they should be the first choice route, particularly for women with high risk factors, including a BMI of over 30, as they are unlikely to increase the risk of thromboembolic disease or stroke unlike the oral preparations. Examples of estrogen-only preparations for women with no uterus, we have twice-weekly patches like Everel and Estradot with their different strengths, as well as gels and sprays like Estragel, Sandrina and Linsetto. We may also use these preparations for women with a uterus if we avoid endometrial hyperplasia and the increased risk of endometrial cancer by giving progestogenic opposition with a levonorgestrel intrauterine system or marina coil or micronized progesterone like neutrogestin capsules. As an example of sequential combined HRT causing a monthly bleed for women with a uterus, we have twice weekly Everell sequi patches. Continuous period free combined HRT is not suitable in the perimenopause or within 12 months of the last menstrual period. And an example would be twice-weekly Everell Conti patches. We will now look at the oral options. And an example of an estrogen-only oral preparation is Eleste Solo with two different strengths. Examples of oral sequential combined HRT offering a monthly bleed are Femstone and Eleste Duet, also with the two different strengths and examples of period-free oral continuous combined HRT preparations, again not suitable in the perimenopause or within 12 months of the last menstrual period, we have Femstone Conti and its low-dose version, Indivina, Cleofem and Elestuet Conti. Second-line preparations would be by Juve and Tibolone, but researching the pros and cons of these last two may be advisable. We also have a box about low estrogen options, for example, for women 60 or over, like Everell 25 patch and Estrogel as unopposed estrogens, or as continuous combined preparations, Femilstone Conti with 0.5 mg of estradiol 
or clear lungs. We also have a reminder about addressing lifestyle factors and optimally managing conditions like hypertension and diabetes. And also the herbal medicines are not available on prescription and that they are largely unregulated products lacking consistency. And for urogenital atrophy, we can use Ovestin cream, Vajarux vaginal tablets, Invagispessaries, Estring vaginal rings and Blissel gel. And finally, of course, we have over-the-counter vaginal moisturizers such as Replens MD and YesVM. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guideline. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching and goodbye.